is, uh, my lord, this is uh, the claimant's cross appeal uh, against um, parts of the refusal uh, uh, of his application below from Mr Justice J. Uh, it, it's an, uh, a cross appeal against the refusal of uh, his claim on the GDPR. Uh, and uh, in one very limited respect, uh, the refusal uh, of permission to uh, serve out his claim of malicious falsehood. Um, uh, as we'll come to see, there was a, uh, a much broader case on what Mr Justice Jay called the straightforward route on malice. Uh, my client's case was uh, that the second defendant, uh, and the first defendant for which he's controlling mind, but only those defendants, uh, were uh, parties to conspiracy with others uh, to, to injure him. Uh, and that was the basis of the straightforward route to malice. The cross appeal is only on uh, Luchansky malice, uh, and I'll come to that uh, second. Um, it's perhaps it, important to understand um, the uh, uh, plea the case just uh, in a very rudimentary sense. In the su first volume, the supplementary bundle, the uh, original particulars of claim before the parts for which permission wasn't given uh, was struck out. Um, you'll see at paragraph 22, uh, it's at tab three of the supplementary bundle, uh, and paragraph 22 uh, sets out uh, what are called particulars of inaccuracy uh, in, uh, in some detail. Uh, it, it stretches over uh, three pages. Uh, these are things that the claimant says uh, are factually inaccurate. They obviously overlap in some respects with the defamatory single meanings he's pleaded. Can I just stop you there? Um, of course, you said paragraph two of the original particulars. Oh, I'm sorry, my lady, 22 of the original particulars. Right. Uh, starts on page B23. Do apologize. Now, there's obviously significant overlap um, between some of the things that he says are factually inaccurate uh, and are falsehoods, uh, in malicious falsehoods in GDPR. They, they overlap, obviously, with some of the defamatory single meanings, but they also go further. Certain things that are simply wrong, he wants not to be reported because they're untrue. Uh, and I do emphasize, in both malicious falsehood and inaccuracy under GDPR, he, he actively wants the burden of proving falsity, of proving that they are uh, I I inaccurate uh, beyond the natural ordinary meanings in publications two to eight. Um, uh, the, the grounds of cross appeal, um, it, it's important to appreciate that both in malicious falsehood and in the data protection claim, uh, there was no dispute that the gateway uh, limb of the test was satisfied uh, on both torts. So for GDPR, it was Article 79.2. For malicious falsehood, it was a tort committed in the jurisdiction. Uh, and Mr Justice Jay was similarly satisfied to the extent there was a challenge on the forum conveniens limb, uh, the common law, classic forum conveniens limb, uh, for, for both. So the sole question for Mr Justice Jay uh, and go on this appeal is essentially whether these calls of action pass the merit slip, i.e. whether they were strong enough to withstand uh, the equivalent of a defendant's application for summary judgment um, on the facts. Um, uh, and I understand that test to be uh, agreed between the parties. Um, ju just one distinction, if we very, very briefly look at the uh, respondent's notice, uh, which is in uh, the core bundle uh, at tab two, And it's page A17. Yes. The data protection uh, grants of cross appeal uh, focus on respectively Article 3.1 and secondly Article 3.2. Um, uh, and it's, it, it would be enough for service out for uh, us to succeed on either of those limbs. The same is not true on malicious falsehood. Um, on, on malicious falsehood, there is a ground concerning Luchansky malice uh, and a ground concerning Section 3 of the Defamation Act 1952. In respect to malicious falsehood, we would have to win on both of those grounds in order for the malicious falsehood claim to be served out. But when I say win, I mean establish that there is a case that could withstand summary judgment, because they're separate um, elements of the tort. Uh, I'm going to begin, if I may, with uh, the data protection uh, claim. Uh, this is, I think as far as any of us are aware, the first uh, case, maybe in any jurisdiction, on Article 3 of GDPR itself. Um, uh, there have been cases under the predecessor uh, directive on establishment, but we understand this to be the first Article 3 claim on the territorial application uh, of, of GDPR. Um, parenthetically, I, I point out, and it is mentioned in our skeleton argument, 
this was a claim that was brought under GDPR proper, EU GDPR, um, and is therefore preserved under the transitional um, agreements. Um, there is no longer direct effect of GDPR uh, in the UK. There is only uh, the Data Protection Act 2018, which gives rise to UK GDPR, uh, which would be the case in respect of uh, processing going forward. Um, UK GDPR is essentially, in respect of Article 3, the same as EU GDPR, except that references to the Union are replaced by references to the United Kingdom. So this isn't a, a dead letter appeal. Um, the uh, territorial application of EU GDPR uh, and indeed UK GDPR um, would, would work along the same lines because they are materially identical, notwithstanding there's been a change in regime. Um, GDPR itself is in the Cross Appeal Authorities uh, Volume 1, Tab 1, uh, and I would ask if the court would mind um, turning that up, uh, please. It may or may not be helpful um, just to, to give a, a very high overview. One of the strange things uh, in, in a jurisdiction appeal about GDPR is that um, we're acquainted, if we're looking at the other private law causes of action, to, to thinking about private law uh, and think about jurisdiction through the prism of the Brussels regulation uh, and to the extent it's service out the, the domestic law that corresponds. The slightly unusual thing um, about data protection is it doesn't fit into the usual binaries uh, that concern this area of the law. It, it doesn't uh, quite fit comfortably into the traditional public law, private law split. Uh, uh, and the more interesting binary is it doesn't quite fit uh, the traditional separation in private law between jurisdiction, sort of the right for a court to hear a case, uh, and the applicable law, the law to be applied to it. Um, data protection is a, a system of public law with regulators who have territorial jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, the regulator applies its national law. Uh, and in the old directive, there, there was no provision independently for private law jurisdiction. It was just a case of falling within the tort gateway uh, under the old directive in the 98 Act. When GDPR comes in, um, it does introduce a freestanding jurisdiction, a lex specialis for jurisdiction, which is Article 79.2, that allocate which court should hear the follow on private law claims for damages or other remedies. Um, but it keeps um, what had functioned as essentially uh, the determiner under old law of which national legislation implementing the directive should apply. So under the old directive, Article 4 essentially was asking, is a particular data controller um, established in this particular member state so that that member state's law implementing the directive will apply to it and that member state's uh, supervising authority, the ICO or CINL, CNIL, um, would have jurisdiction over it. Um, and the basis, as we'll come to see, of the application of national law through Article 4 of the Directive was uh, on one of two bases. Either there was establishment uh, in that member state and the processing was in the context of that establishment, or um, it, if the uh, controller was not established in any member state of the Union, it was nonetheless uh, using equipment uh, in the territory of that member state. Um, one thing's back to, uh, to Ted Stevens in the series of tubes. You either had to be established or using equipment on the territory. That was Article 4 of the old directive. It, it was Section 5 of the Data Protection Act of 1998. GDPR is very different. GDPR still uses the test for establishment in Article 3.1, but in Article 3.2 is an entirely new provision that didn't exist in the directive or, or the national law that implemented it, which sets up two uh, forms of activity uh, which are undergone by controllers who are not established. But nonetheless, if the processing relates to either of those two forms of activity, GDPR will apply even though they're not established. So there was a, a, a very conscious attempt, we say, in Article 3.2 to expand the territorial application of GDPR to forms of processing overseas by non-EU data controllers. <clears throat> Turning to tab one, um, 
sorry. Yes, my lady. I'm sorry, I, I had uh, still the appeal uh, authorities from yesterday rather than the cross bill authorities. Um, in the regulation itself, uh, which is, I'm sorry, tab B, e, yeah. um, the Marlies in principle, I, I think it's trite that, that EU law should be given um, a, a purpose of interpretation. Uh, Data Protection Directive 9546 had twin objectives, um, although they, they were closely in tandem. The first was to protect the, the privacy and data protection rights of data subjects in the Union. But the motivating force behind that was, at least in part, to ensure the free flow uh, of data um, uh, across the single market and to give consumers confidence in giving their personal data to the emerging e-commerce industry um, for the sake of the, the proper functioning of the single market. Um, GDPR then is, is passed uh, by the European Parliament and Council in 2016. Uh, and we say that the recitals uh, give a very clear indication of the purpose, particularly in respect of territorial application, to overseas, uh, particularly tech and online uh, companies. So recitals uh, one to seven. Recital one begins with the emphasis on um, personal data, the uh, protection of uh, personal data as a fundamental right uh, under the Charter, independent of uh, its right to privacy. Um, uh, Article 2 sets up the balance between uh, giving natural persons confidence in the processing of their personal data, but also the economic function uh, in a free single market. Uh, number 3 looks at the predecessor directive. Uh, number 4 recognises that there's a, a balancing of rights to occur. Five, uh, economic and social integration resulting from the functioning of the internal market has led to a substantial increase in cross-border flows of personal data uh, and its exchange between public and private actors uh, uh, across the union. Six, refers to rapid technological development and globalization which have brought new challenges to the protection of personal data. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, looking at the end of Recital 6, should further facilitate the free flow of personal data within the Union and the transfer to third countries and international organisations while ensuring a high level of the protection of personal data. Uh, and number seven, these developments require a strong and more coherent data protection framework in the Union, backed by strong enforcement, given the importance of creating the trust that will allow the digital economy to develop across the internal market. Natural persons should have control of their own personal data legal and practical certainty for natural persons, economic operators, public authorities should be enhanced. There are only a, a couple of other recitals that I uh, did very briefly want to go to. Um, the, the first is over the page at uh, um, recital 15. Recital 15 says, in order to prevent creating a serious risk of circumvention, the protection of natural persons should be technologically neutral and should not depend on the techniques used. The protection of natural persons should apply to the processing of personal data by automated means, as well as to manual processing, if the personal data are contained or intended to be contained in a filing system. Files or sets of files, as well as their cover pages, which are not structured according to specific criteria, should not fall within the scope of the regulation. So automated processing is in, uh, but even manual or non-automated processing is in if there is a filing system, if there is a structure to the data. The three most relevant uh, recitals uh, to Article 3 are recitals 22 uh, to 24. Uh, if I could just um, ask your ladyships and your lordship just to read 22 to 24.
page, we, we've cut several hundred of the recitals uh, to give the bundles uh, within manageable degree. Um, so over the page is Article 3 itself. Uh, it begins on uh, page 9 uh, and then over to page 10. Uh, Article 3.3 is irrelevant for the purposes of these uh, appeals. We're only concerned with Article 3.1 and 3.2. So Article 3.1 reflects the predecessor provision about GDPR um, and its territorial application based on um, the processing activity complained of. So in this case, that's the obtaining, reporting, writing, editing, publishing, disclosing, storing of my client's personal data. Is that uh, processing in the context of uh, an establishment in the union? And the first thing to say is that establishment as a data protection term of art uh, means something very, very different to establishment, for instance, in Brussels regulation. Uh, it, it doesn't mean a branch, it doesn't mean an office, it doesn't mean employees. It's about whether or not um, the data controller will be commercial. Uh, domestic processing is out with the scope of the regulation. The, uh, the, the commercial data controller is orienting its activity towards the European Union. That's what establishment, it's a binary question as to whether or not they're established in the union. They have a branch here, it's, it's incredibly straightforward, but you would assume from recitals, having a, a, a branch or the, the legal form of um, particular form of presence is, is simply not the test. The question is the orientation uh, of economic activity. Uh, and Bell Timo, the second of the trio of cases, um, to which we'll go to very shortly, uh, it is a classic case of something that had a registered office in one country, but was a website that was orienting its economic activity um, at another member state uh, within the EU. So that's Article 3.1. Uh, Article 3.2 uh, is uh, entirely new and essentially um, asks the question, if not established in the Union, so this is, for instance, an American outfit that's not established in the Union, does it nonetheless either offer goods or services irrespective of whether payment is required for data subjects in the European Union? Or does it monitor the behaviour of data subjects while they're in the Union? And if the answer to either of those questions is yes, is the processing complained of related to those activities? Completely new test in GDPR. Turning to Article 3.1 first, um, the, the test for establishment, um, uh, we saw uh, yesterday that the Court of Appeal in King Lewis was somewhat dismissive of the idea of sort of targeting um, uh, the subjective intent. But the important thing to remember about data protection is it's not just uh, or, or even mostly uh, about publication. It's about all forms of uh, data processing, um, primarily out with uh, the media and publication sphere. Um, uh, and so the test that has been uh, refined by three decisions of the Court of Justice uh, Google Spain, Bell Timo, and Amazon, um, the test comes down to whether or not the controller is orienting its activity towards uh, the European Union. Um, the first of these cases, which is somewhat important, uh, although it arises in a slightly different context, is uh, Google Spain, which is in the second volume of cross bill authorities uh, at tab 8. Um, Google Inc. was the American search engine. Uh, it had a legal subsidiary in Spain, which almost everybody accepted was an establishment, an independent legal body that was an establishment in Spain. Uh, and that body in Spain didn't do search engine, it sold advertising. It was the economic raison d'etre for um, the search engine. It sold advertising and was uh, orienting its activities at the advertising market in Spain. Uh, and several questions came to the Court of Justice, including uh, whether or not what a search engine did constituted processing at all. That doesn't concern us today. But the primary question was whether or not, um, given that uh, Google Spain was selling advertising and its parent company was uh, conducting search, whether what the parent company was doing in search was in the context of the activities of its subsidiary. Uh, and the Court of Justice uh, decided, uh, yes, it was. 
uh, and one can see the second holding on page uh, 1023G. That's page 385 of the electronic uh, bundle. At the second holding, it was carried out in the context of the activities of an establishment of the controller on the territory of a member state within the meaning of Article 4 of the directive. Um, uh, and you'll see over the page where the operator of a search engine set up in a member state a branch or subsidiary which is intended to promote and sell advertising space offered by that engine and which orientated its activity towards the inhabitants of that member state. Now this was fairly clear on establishment because there was an establishment in the traditional sense so it was really only a question about whether the uh, parent company was acting in the context uh, of those activities and itself orienting its economic activity towards um, it's worth just turning to the Advocate General's uh, opinion at page 1040, uh, which would be uh, page 1040, which would be page 402 in the Electronic Authority. Uh, and paragraphs 64 to 68 really is the crux of the Advocate General's uh, view. He says, 64, in my opinion, the court should approach the question of territorial applicability from the perspective of the business model of internet search engine providers. This, as I have mentioned, normally relies on keyword advertising, which is the source of income, and as such, the economic raison d'etre for the provision of a free information location tool in the form of a search engine. So that's the reason for the relationship uh, that there is an establishment and the, the search engine is acting in the context of the activity in the context of the activities of that establishment because uh, the uh, economic work being done is the economic raison d'etre of the search engine. Uh, at, at paragraph 66, moreover, even if Article 4 of the directive is based on a single concept of controller as it regards its substantive provisions, I think for the purposes of deciding on the preliminary issue of territorial applicability, an economic operator must be considered as a single unit, and thus at this stage of analysis not to be dissected on the basis of its individual activities relating to processing of personal data or different groups of data subjects to which its activities relate. So at least in the context of the activities of an establishment, the Advocate General is saying you, you need to look at uh, Google Inc and Google Spain together. You, you, you can't um, split it down uh, in, in the way that Google had asked. In conclusion, processing of personal data takes place within the context of a controller's establishment if that establishment acts as the bridge for the referencing service to the advertising market of that member state, even if the technical data processing operations are situated in other member states or third countries. And you can see at the bottom of 68, again, we have this idea of orientates its activity towards the inhabitants uh, of that state. And that's then picked up by uh, the Court of Justice uh, in its judgment, which begins, I'm so sorry, uh, which begins on page 1068, it's paragraphs uh, 42 uh, to uh, 60. Uh, for your ladyships and your lordships note. There are only two paragraphs in, in this part of the judgment I just wanted to um, highlight. Paragraph 58. It cannot be accepted that the processing of personal data carried out for the purposes of the operation of the search engine should escape the obligations and guarantees laid down by Directive 9546, which would compromise the Directive's effectiveness and the effective and complete protection of the fundamental rights and freedoms of natural persons which the Directive seeks to ensure, in particular their right to privacy with respect to the processing of personal data, a right to which the Directive accords special importance as confirmed in particular by Article 1.1 uh, uh, and the recitals. We say that's even more true under uh, GDPR. And then over the page of paragraph 60, uh, the, the Court of Justice uh, essentially adopts the Advocate General's conclusion. And you'll see again at the end of paragraph 60, uh, the, the, the test was whether or not the controller overseas uh, for establishment orientates its activity towards the inhabitants of that member state. So that's Google Spain. Uh, the next case uh, in uh, the bundle of tab 9 is uh, Valtimo, starting on uh, page 442 uh, in the electronic version. 
and uh, the, the headnote gives uh, a very uh, helpful summary. Uh, the data controller was a company registered in Slovakia, uh, but it operated a website dealing in Hungarian properties. Uh, we will uh, come back to some of these facts shortly. And then at the bottom of the page, held that the concept of establishment in Article 4.1 of the Directive was to be given a flexible definition and did not refer solely to undertakings established in the place where they were registered, that it permitted the application of the law on the protection of personal data of a member state other than that in which a data controller was registered, insofar as the controller exercised, and this is the test, through stable arrangements in that member state, a real and effective activity, even a minimal one, in the context of which that processing was carried out. So establishment, we're looking for the orientation of economic activity followed up by um, real and effective activity exercised through stable arrangements, even if minimal. That's the test uh, that we get from Veltimo. Uh, and just a couple of paragraphs, uh, because it's a, a relatively and relatively short judgment from the Court of Justice. Um, but paragraphs uh, 29 uh, to 35 are, are, are the real crux. Um, at the bottom of 29, both the degree of stability of the arrangements and the effective exercise of activities in that other member state must be interpreted in the light of the specific nature of the economic activities and the provision of services concerned. This is particularly true for undertakings uh, offering services exclusively over the internet. So, whereas you might well expect a travel agent to have an actual branch in you know, a particular place in order for there to be an establishment, if it's merely a travel booking website, it's Expedia rather than it's Cook. You, you wouldn't necessarily expect there to be a branch with employees uh, that, that, that operates in that way because that's simply not how um, uh, undertakings offering their services exclusively over the internet work. At 30, um, the, the objective pursued by the directive is ensuring effective and complete protection of the right to privacy. Over the page of 31, in order to attain that objective, it should be considered that the concept of establishment extends to any real and effective activity, even a minimal one, exercised through stable arrangements. Uh, and then at 34 and 35, in the second place, it's necessary to establish whether the processing of personal data at issue is carried out in the context of the activities of that establishment. And then uh, the third case, uh, uh, which is uh, the next tab over, tab 10, um, is uh, the Amazon case. And the only uh, passages I want to go through in the Amazon case start at 501 of the electronic. Uh, it's uh, page 296 internal. It's paragraphs 72 to 78 are um, the uh, relevant parts. 75 adopts uh, the test, real and effective activity, even a minimal one, exercised through stable arrangements from Valtimo. Uh, and makes clear, however, at 76, and this is important, um, the fact that it does not have a branch or subsidiary in a member state does not preclude it from having an establishment there. But such an establishment cannot exist merely because the undertaking's website is available there. So just because you have a website and I can view it in Hungary doesn't mean that you're established in Hungary. There has to be the orientation of your economic activity through some sort of stable arrangement, even if that activity is minimal. You have to be orienting in some minimal way through stable arrangements. Um, uh, uh, and that's the test for a uh, website. My own friends asked me to go to the next paragraph. Rather, as the court has previously held, both the degree of stability of the arrangements and the effective exercise of activities in the member state in question must be assessed. Could you um, just repeat um, what you said was the test, the relevant test? Yes, my lady. Um, the, the Court of Justice in Amazon sets it out at paragraph 75 and says the concept of establishment the court has previously held that it extends to, and this is the, the test, any real and effective activity, 
even a minimal one, exercise through stable arrangements. Not sure that's grammatically um, <laughs> perfect, but. Yes, not, not immediately obvious why that test doesn't cover someone who just publishes through a website. No. <laughs> but it doesn't, because that's what the, the general tells I, I, I can understand. The Court of Justice in, in, in Amazon is obviously concerned with the idea that um, if it were the case that mere accessibility of a website uh, led to establishment, then effectively every website would automatically be established in every member state at once. And in terms of the internal conflict, bearing in mind that data protection is primarily a system of public law, um, almost every, every, every commercial website that was set up would need to register uh, probably with a main, um, uh, a sort of a leading authority. The rate of burden would be very, very high. So you and need, I think a, that's you need a bit it. more, but not much more. You need a bit more, but minimal. Mm. It looks, I, I was wondering whether it, it works this way, that that that's the, the general scope. It goes that far, but doesn't cover the mere internet presence of the, the, the fugitive defendant. That, that's so this exactly is sort of a carve out, as it were, from that. Me, mere availability is, is a carve out, but otherwise it extends to any real activity. As long as that activity is exercised through stable arrangements. So I have to accept that if it was simply that in the 20 year history of a website, it, it happened to sell one baseball cap to Slovakia, that, that might not constitute real and effective, um, real and effective minimal activity exercised through stable arrangements. It would be real activity, but it's not stable. It's what does stable also. arrangements mean? Well, that's a very good question, my lord, and there's no authority on it except Mr. Justice Jay's uh, decision. We, we say, in the context of this case and on the facts of this case, where you have to look at the nature of the enterprise, the nature of the controller's economic activity, here it's a media website. If one is setting up a, an online media company, what is the most stable form of uh, arrangement for income that you could possibly have? Anyone in the media industry will tell you it's certainly not advertising, at least not in the last 15 years. Uh, it's not one-off donations. It's not rich patrons. Probably not even bequests. What every online media business wants for the stability, for the predictability of its income over time is subscriptions. And Mr. Justice Jay rejected that argument. He said that subscriptions weren't stable because they could be cancelled at any time. But that's to set a test for stability that, that's essentially, I don't know, or almost as though a, a consumer has sort of made a trust bequesting all future income and irrevocable trust that it can never take back. A subscription, we say, in the context of an online media uh, publication is the most stable form of arrangement that you could have. But this is a free, um, sub this is not behind a paywall, this is a free subscription. So it just means, please send me your material. It's a voluntary subscription. Yeah. So the, sub the paying the subscription, uh, sorry, access to the material is not contingent on paying the subscription. That's certainly true. Um, but the subscriptions are, I mean, they're variously described as donations and subscriptions, but the difference between them is that some of the donations, there are five categories of income as we'll come to see. The second is one-off donations, but the first set through Patreon are variously described as subscriptions or donations that are not one-off. They are recurring payments to support, uh, and I think it's fair to say a bit like the, the, the Guardian's model. It's not purely a, a sort of pay-for-play. They are ideologically attracted to the idea that anyone can read irrespective of ability to pay, uh, and, and that's commendable. So that, but they are still encouraging subscriptions, and the overwhelming bulk of their income comes from subscriptions, because that's what any media company that needs to, to um, sort of keep a roof over its head wants and needs. It's the most stable form of income there is if you're in this business. So it's the business model for many websites to have Patreon as this. Uh, integral to it. I, I think for new, newer businesses um, like Substack or, or, or Patreon, the, these sorts of um, platforms, Patreon, I should explain, isn't just used for media companies. So anyone who does work, there are freelance book writers or there are artists or other forms of performance well, who, who can, exactly, who, who can attract Patreon. And I think Patreon are, allows both for subscriptions and for one off donations. They're split in Mr. Torres's evidence. But here, the, the bulk of the money, 85% of the money that 
D1 gets is through recurring subscriptions. Uh, and we say that on any view, a subscription is stable. Uh, and the, re the activity is, is, is real, but the question is whether or not uh, there were a sufficient number of subscriptions uh, from the UK and EU so as to evidence the orientation of D1's economic activity to the EU and the UK. Uh, and it's that that, that I, I need to show on this uh, ground of appeal. Um, Mr Justice Jay's judgment uh, is uh, at, at tab 6, and it's only a very short passage uh, that, I'm sorry, the core bundle of tab 6, uh, page A95. Just to give a very high level overview of paragraphs 45 to 58, he reviews the case law and the um, EDPB guidelines, which uh, I think my learned friends go take in some more detail. Um, uh, at 59 to 60, he gives a, a summary of the pleaded case. But the, the critical um, passage is, is 61 to 64 on Article 3. Uh, 61 is Mr. Doris's evidence. We're going to actually dive into that in just a moment. So uh, I'm just marking it there. This is about the three UK and three EU subscriptions since August 2020. So that's actually after uh, after the claim was issued. It, it was only uh, after the claim was issued that you were able to subscribe in euros and pounds. Before that, for the first 14 months, all subscriptions had to be in US dollars wherever you were coming from. But since August, they said, we now accept, if you're in the UK and the EU, we now accept your factoring subscriptions in euros and pounds. And from August onwards, there were some extra subscriptions before um, this evidence was filed. And in that period, three of them were in euros and three of them were in pounds. So we can infer in that period, at least, six of the subscriptions uh, are, are, arose uh, from the EU and UK. Um, uh, 63, uh, Mr Justice J, uh, correctly uh, identified the summary judgment test. It wasn't being decided one way or the other. Uh, it was uh, about reverse summary judgment. And the determination is a paragraph 64. Uh, you recognise that a branch or subsidiary is by no means determinative, uh, but it, it doesn't have any employees or representatives here. The fact that it has a readership in the UK, which is not minimal, I think it was just over 5%, uh, is of no more than marginal relevance uh, by itself. It could not begin to satisfy Article 3.1. It is clear that the first defendant's journalistic endeavour is not oriented towards the UK in any relevant respect. Um, we had considerable evidence about the, the bulk of the early articles, uh, and what proportion of them uh, by D1, D2 were about my client, uh, who obviously is based here. Uh, and certainly uh, those articles had a higher proportion of UK readership than the website uh, as a whole. But he's saying that the journalistic endeavour is not uh, aimed uh, at the UK. He, he says that the fact that it may be of interest to some readers is, is not germane, uh, nor is the claimant's nationality. But, but here's the crux of it. The real question is whether, taking the claimant's case at its reasonable pinnacle, he has persuaded me that he has the sufficient makings of an argument on stable arrangements to enable him to pass through the merits portal. I cannot accept the proposition that less than a handful of UK subscriptions to a platform which solicits payment for services on an entirely generic basis and which in any event can be cancelled at any time amounts to arrangements which are sufficient in nature, number and type to fulfil the language and spirit of Article 3.1 and amount to being stable. Uh, to the extent it improves the claimant's case slightly, the 7th of August tweet postdated all of the publications uh, sued upon. Now, the text of the tweet is uh, probably most handily set out uh, in uh, my skeleton argument uh, at uh, page A78. And paragraph 22 of my skeleton points out, with, with references uh, to the evidence in the bundle, the defendant's evidence. At 9% of their geographically identified readers were in the UK or EU, but there was um, further that were unascertained. It sets out from Mr. Doris's witness statement the five uh, sources of income. So the first is uh, the subscriptions, then there's the one-off donations, then some branded merchandise sales, then some Google ads, and then some sponsorship. 
but you'll see the overwhelming bulk is uh, the subscriptions via Patreon. Uh, and we uh, relied on, we, we had the pleaded case, we also did include uh, the tweet in, in the bundle, you'll see it there. There's a tweet of 7th of August 2020, uh, which says, everyone in the UK or EU can now pledge to Patreon in their local currency of euros or pounds. This will help prevent you paying extra conversion fees from your bank, followed by a hyperlink to the Patreon page for subscriptions to D1's website. Now our point is that isn't just orienting from this point in time. They were always interested, or equally interested, in an EU or UK audience. And indeed, we would like to know how many of the US dollar subscriptions in the first 14 months related to people from the EU and the UK, because it might have been many of them. We simply don't have the figures. But we know that after the 7th of August, after Forensic News made clear it was orienting its economic activity at the EU and UK, it did get at least a minimal number of subscriptions in pounds and euros, three in pounds, three in euros, in the next four months or so. We don't actually know how many subscriptions it got over its uh, 18 months before the hearing, so we can't actually even say, even if it was only those six subscriptions, we can't actually say what proportion of total subscriptions they are. That would obviously have to be available um, uh, as a result of disclosure. Uh, and as well as the subscriptions, then there are a couple of donations, and I think the sale of one baseball cap. So our point is this, e even if this were trial and we were arguing about are there stable arrangements, Subscriptions are stable arrangements. Uh, and uh, is there minimal activity, economic activity, that demonstrates orienting your economic activity towards the EU and UK? We would say yes. But we don't even have to hit that standard. We just had to show that there was a uh, strong enough evidential case on the defendant's evidence to resist summary judgment that there might be minimal activity through stable arrangements. Uh, and we say that Mr Justice Jay uh, was wrong uh, to reject that. We note that the merchandise and sales uh, is through uh, a, a, an online store that accepts shipping addresses e in the UK and EU. Uh, the PayPal link uh, permitted uh, payment of forensic news in uh, euros, pounds, uh, and Danish krona. So it's offering for profit e commerce services to consumers in the European Union. Uh, there are uh, donation, one off donations as well as subscriptions in euros and pounds. Uh, and, and there's the question of cookies, which really, I think, belongs in, in Article 3.2. So, we say that we uh, did uh, hurdle uh, the merit slim uh, on that. Oh, and there's one final point, I'm sorry. The, the point about the timing of the tweet, so it's true to say that the timing of the tweet came after first publication of the articles. But obviously, the articles are all still being published on the website to this day. There is, if you like, ongoing processing uh, of the claims personal data, including by publication. Um, so the, the relevance of the date of the tweet it is not as Mr Justice Jay for a dispositive in the defendant's favour. Firstly, we say it, it is not the beginning of the orientation of activities of the UK and EU, but it's reflective of existing orientation um, towards the UK and EU, recognising that it was a sufficiently worthwhile market to permit uh, currencies uh, uh, that the, the company would bear um, the, the cost of uh, currency transfer rather than the individual subscriber. But secondly, there is continuing publication. So in respect of a case going forward, there is now processing, uh, which is after, even if Mr Justice Jay was right and this was the beginning of the orientation, uh, there is publication uh, that continues and therefore processing that continues. So that's our case on Article 3.1. I think it's fair to say, uh, Mr Justice Arnold, uh, who gave us permission to cross appeal on both grounds, uh, actually thought we had uh, a stronger case uh, on uh, Article 3.2 than on 3.1. Uh, and it is important that the um, arguments that I've just made, uh, particularly around the tweet and the evidence of uh, actively targeting uh, subscriptions in the UK and the EU, uh, it is relevant to both, which is a point we think uh, might have uh, been lost in translation before Mr Justice Jay. So Article 3.2 provides uh, that the regulation applies to processing of personal data of subjects who are in the union by a controller who is not established in the union. So if we're wrong on Article 3.1, they're not established, but they are processing my client's personal data. 
The question is whether that processing, that journalistic processing, is related to one of two things. It doesn't have to be one of two things. It just has to be related to. And Mr. Justice Jay took a very narrow view of what related to meant, and we say he was wrong to do so. The first thing that the journalistic processing could be related to is the offering of goods or services irrespective of whether a payment of the data subject is required to data subjects in the union. So if you offer uh, a free news website, if you offer a free, um, it, it could be a heartbeat monitor from your Fitbit or a, a period tracker, you could offer any number of free apps, any sort of uh, goods or service, whether or not payment is required, to citizens within the EU, the question is whether the processing complained of, and in this case it's journalistic processing, is related to the offering of goods and services. Now in a nutshell, Mr Justice Jay held that the offering of goods and services uh, was essentially um, the, the online store, the selling of baseball caps, which are, uh, are branded. Uh, and his view was that, I think there was only one baseball cap sold to the UK, but essentially, it might well be that they are offering goods and services into uh, the EU because they accepted kroner and euros and pounds and they allowed EU shipping addresses. And he didn't think that the offering of goods and services through the online shop was related to the journalistic activities of the website. Now, there are two grounds for thinking that conclusion is very clearly wrong. The first is they are related. They are related because the, fun, the purpose of the online shop, and indeed the purpose of subscriptions and the donations, is the economic raison d'etre of the, sorry, the website is the economic raison d'etre of the shop. Just like uh, Google Spain as a subsidiary was there to sell advertising, and that was the economic raison d'etre was to support the search engine, so the selling of goods through the shop is there to fund the journalism. It's entirely expressed in the defendant's own evidence. So even if Mr Justice Jay had been right to really confine his thinking to the offering of goods and services through the shop, we say those were related, and any construction of related to that is so narrow as to consider that the defendant's shop is unrelated to its journalism product, they're not even separate entities doing it, it's the same entity doing it. Not that that mattered in Google Spain. We say any construction of related to that was that narrow would be wrong as a matter of construction. But the second reason that Mr Justice Jay is clearly wrong is that the journalistic website itself is a service which is offered potentially for free, although many people choose to pay for it, to data subjects in the European Union. He doesn't deal with that in the judgment. At all. Was that a submission you made? Yes, ma'am. That he didn't deal with it? I, 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 I'm almost, I would have to go back and check the transcripts, but in my head, certainly, I think we did make it. The website itself is a service that is offered to the European Union. And obviously, the, journal the processing of my client's data could not be more closely related to the, the new service that's offered. Now, you do then come back to the question of, is, are the goods, or is the website as a service, being offered to subjects in the European Union? Now, we don't think that offered necessarily connotes any particular degree of targeting or orienting. Because if you get into targeting or orienting, it's really started to sound like Article 3.1 establishment. The EDPB guidelines disagree. They, they draw uh, from the uh, Brussels Recast Regulation case on Article 15, consumer rights. They draw upon that to import a sort of notion of targeting at EU, EU citizens specifically in the offer of goods and services. We say that's probably wrong, but it really doesn't matter on the facts of this case because we have an article case that they have done that and the tweet confirming that you can do subscriptions to the website to support its activities in euros and pounds would be all the targeting that would be needed. So that's how we say we would, if, even if we're wrong about establishment, the same evidence of orienting activity can be relied upon as directing for the purposes of the website to service and, and indeed the shipping addresses and currencies on the online shop would show the offer of goods and services through the shop. Uh, and we say it's a very short step to say that the shop is related to the journalistic processing because that's why the shop exists. 
The other route, and, and they are alternatives, they're not cumulative, the other route to us getting home on Article 3.2 is on the basis of uh, monitoring. So is the journalistic processing, editing, storing, consulting, publishing, um, obtaining, is it related to the monitoring of data subjects' behaviour if that behaviour takes place in the union? Now, the reason behind this is that there'll be plenty, for the most part, it could be cookies, or it could be um, health apps, or it could be uh, location tracking services that are used to underpin apps like Google Maps. There are an awful lot of mass monitoring tools, but we know from Recycle 15 that GDPR is technologically neutral. It doesn't only uh, uh, apply to particular forms of technology. Anything that would count as processing, uh, and the EDPB guidelines confirm this, especially if there is, after the capture of that data, there is an intent on the part of the controller to analyse that data with a view to profiling people, that's monitoring. So there's a certain degree of monitoring that we think is common ground, that there are cookies for Facebook and Google that certainly support the advertising um, revenue stream for the business, as they do for almost any monetized website. But cookies that allow for things like Google Analytics, who's reading what, which story succeeded, what was the bounce rate, how long did people spend on this page? Are these articles too long because the, the bounce rate is too high or the time reading is too quick? Those sort of analytics and cookies are used by editorial organisations all of the time. So we say that the sort of monitoring that goes on by cookies analysing readers from the European Union is absolutely related to the journalistic processing because cookies and analytics are used for editorial purposes as well as for advertising purposes. So if they know that stories about my client are performing particularly well because the web analytics based on cookies are telling them that loads of readers in the UK are very interested in this story, that would be an editorial judgment. The other reason that we say that we would get through Article 32B is because the nature of the activity whereby the defendants have essentially tried to hoover up all available information in the public domain or otherwise about my client and make it available to the world. In a series that they announced that was to be headlined the Walter Soriano Files, a headline with which they were particularly pleased. Whether that processing is by purely automated terms or a mixture of automated and manual, some online searches, the transfer of a very large archive of uh, information from um, Israel about the court proceedings in which he had been involved, all of that um, data processing is with a view to creating a filing system and a profile of my client. It is, in every sense, monitoring what he does. The reason that monitoring exists as a potential link to apply GDPR to non-established controllers is to protect the privacy rights of data subjects here. The fact that your Fitbit data might be one of 10 million people that's looked at by a, a data controller in the state because you've chosen to use its app, there is at least, I suppose, some risk of profiling. And so European law kicks in to make sure that you as a data subject are protected. But, um, what you're doing here surely is turning this um, provision on its head. What it says is the regulation applies to the processing where the processing activities are related to the monitoring. You're saying the um, journalism is related to the monitoring. You're saying the, the um, monitoring is related to the journalism. I think they're related to each other. Well, um, it, it's, it's, the, the, the journalism is not conducted for the purposes of assisting or in any way affecting the monitoring. Your, your argument is the monitoring is there as an adjunct to the, to, the, to the journalism. But I think that would be true of almost all, um, all data controllers. I mean, very few uh, non-established data controllers would ever be monitoring simply for the sake of it. The monitoring is done for a particular purpose. So you monitor all of the heart rate monitors on Fitbits in the United Kingdom with a view to building up a, a profile of you know, people in the South East have high heart rates. That the monitoring is only ever the first stage of the actual purpose for which the data processor will be processing the data. So we don't say that's it would be any different for um, for a, a media organisation. That the monitoring is often the sort of general harvest of data. The processing activities over which people will normally be seeking either compensation or other orders or regulatory action is about the subsequent uh, profiling activity, which is really more likely to be the economically valuable activity. That wants to conduct. What I'm saying is that if you were suing for 
um, an intrusion into your client's privacy by uh, the monitoring of activities um, within the union, um, monitoring of behaviour within the union. That would be one thing. You're saying, well, here they are profiling their, their, their customers, their, their readers, um, in relation to um, the journalism. That's something quite different, isn't it? Because the journalism comes first, and that, but it's an issue. Yeah, so the processing, the, the processing that you're talking about isn't anything to do with monitoring. It's to do with um, what's being said on the website about your client. We're, we're putting it two ways. That the, one of the ways that we're putting it is that my client's centre of interest is here, his behaviour is all here, and monitoring everything things that he does here through journalism is, is itself monitoring, um, even though it's not done through sort of cookies, which Mr. Justice Jake took a very narrow, technologically restricted view of what monitoring was. But your logic's right. The, the other way that we put the Article 32B case is we say that there's an iterative cycle in any newsroom. So you, you report a particular story uh, and publish it, and there's journalistic processing. There's then a feedback loop that you will see how an audience responds to that particular story using monitoring cookies to support, for instance, the Google Analytics on your website, to see which articles do well, to see which are popular, to see what your audience wants more of. And that monitoring then feeds back into editorial decisions about what you publish next. This was a series of eight articles called the Walter Soriano Files. They, they, they begin with one, and our point is, insofar as there is a, a cycle, an iterative cycle of journalistic processing, monitoring of audience response, editorial decision making, further journalistic processing, monitoring of, of audience response, editorial decision making, that iterative cycle is what makes the monitoring of an audience through cookies and the journalistic processing, which is the, the subject matter of the editorial website, that's what makes the two related. Um, your, your Lordship's right. It, it, we say it's, in most senses, chicken and egg. Your Lordship's, in some sense, is obviously right. that It's always going to start with a piece of journalistic processing uh, and then monitoring comes after. But because there's a sequence of articles, we say that it's, it's part of the iterative cycle of a newsroom. So the, the judge rejected this case at paragraphs uh, 66 to 68. Uh, at 66, uh, he determined uh, that there was nothing to suggest the first defendant was targeting the United Kingdom as regards the goods and services it offers. Uh, he didn't accept our, uh, my submissions on a shipping destination uh, or, or the baseball cap. Um, as you say, Marjorie, he, he doesn't deal with the fact that the website is itself um, a, a service offered, albeit potentially for free, although a lot of people pay for it. It's it really the determination Article 67. He accepts Mr. Price's admission that the clause are related to is narrower and stricter than the phrase in the context of. So you remember when we were looking back at the old cases on establishment in what is now Article 3.1, there had to be an establishment and there had to be processing in the context of. And that's what links Google Spain's advertising with Google Inc. search engine. But the point is, that relationship is, is governed by the words in the context of, whereas Article 3.2, the relationship is governed by the words are related to. And he found that are related to is much narrower. Now we say there's no con reasonable construction why that should be so, and there are very strong policy reasons having regard to the early recitals of GDPR as why that's almost certainly not so. We say if anything, it should have a wider uh, construction than, than in the context of. Uh, because there's uh, not an establishment. Uh, and, and on that basis, he decides, uh, because of the narrow construction, he decides that the journalistic processing was not related to any of the activities uh, that we said fell into Articles 3 to A uh, or B. Uh, and the dismissal of the case on monitoring, uh, you see at paragraph 68, there's no evidence that the use of cookies has anything to do with the monitoring which forms the basis of the, complaint, uh, the claimant's uh, real complaint. Uh, the journalistic activities have been advanced not through the deployment of cookies, but using the internet as an investigative tool. And he says that's not the sort of monitoring uh, that Article 32B has in mind. Now, we say using the internet as a tool to gather information about someone's behavior in the union, to create a file about them, and then to publish it to the world at large, absolutely does fall within monitoring because all terms have to be technologically neutral. But it's the other basis that the cookies is informing editorial uh, analytics that we say is the reason for the relationship. Uh, and it's on that basis 
we say um, that we had at least an arguable case that could survive reverse summary judgment uh, that uh, on one of the limbs, either Article 3.1, uh, 3.2a or 3.2b, uh, there was territorial, uh, potentially territorial applicability uh, of uh, GDPR to this business. Um, my learned friend, uh, given that there's no respondent's notice on this cross appeal, uh, my learned friend's task is uh, <laughs> very simply to uh, explain why the judge was right. He's very kindly uh, agreed to split this morning uh, an hour and a half in my favour and only uh, an hour for himself. I spoke to him uh, a little while ago uh, and said, uh, if possible, contrary to our timetable, I'd like to take an hour and a quarter in opening, just a quarter of an hour in reply. So I was hoping to deal with malicious falsehood just in the next quarter of an hour. I'm not running over, I just wanted to reassure. Uh, I, I will take malicious falsehood at um, uh, a uh, significantly greater pace than I've taken data protection. Um, it's only premised, we, we uh, haven't ceased to believe uh, in our, our primary case, but we accept that the judge uh, was well within uh, his rights to uh, reject it on uh, the sufficiency of the evidence uh, of what we said was the collusion between the second defendant uh, and others uh, in Israel. Uh, and so the only case that's run on malicious falsehood uh, is this uh, rather strange species of um, Luchansky malice. Um, To start from the beginning, let me uh, give, give a frame to this. Uh, Libel being a tort of presumed malice, uh, a, depend, a defendant is obviously entitled to uh, plead and prove that a particular uh, occasion of publication was covered by uh, qualified privilege, uh, uh, which generally, as we know, arises in circumstances where there's a duty to publish and the publisher has a, a corresponding uh, interest in, in receiving it. And obviously there's been expansion of qualified privilege uh, the common law, there are lots of off the peg categories, but it's been expanded by statute, particularly the 96 Act. Uh, and then, if a defendant pleads and proves uh, qualified privilege, the burden shifts back to the claimant to plead and prove express malice. Uh, and I think both my learned friend and I rely on the definition in, in Horrocks and Lowe, the traditional one. Uh, malice effectively amounts to a, a dishonesty or subjective recklessness as to the truth and falsity. There's some interesting dispute in the authorities as to whether there's a second uh, species, what Mr. Justin Nicklin called an endangered species of malice, which is motive malice, so just a predominant intent to injure. Another school of thought says actually all malice is a predominant intent to injure, and it's merely that in speech talks that are concerned with speech and with truth and falsity, the way in which you demonstrate a predominant intention to injure is about the uh, relevant honest belief in the truth of what you're saying. Um, there is also, in some of the authorities, uh, a demonstration that, that QP can be defeated by a plea of express malice where um, the publisher has misused the uh, uh, occasion of qualified privilege. Uh, and I'll be coming to that very shortly. So qualified privilege and malice works uh, in a fairly straightforward way uh, where publication was a, a single instant thing, the sending of a letter, even the sending of an email. Uh, but obviously the internet means that there is continual publication continuous publication. Um, once published online, unless a publisher takes it down, th there is ongoing publication every time somebody reads something at common law. Uh, that once upon a time caused great problems, uh, particularly for the law of limitation. But those who have limitation problems have largely been solved by the single publication rule in section 8 of the 2013 Act. But continual publication does mean that a defendant can initially publish under circumstances covered by qualified privilege uh, and be non-malicious, but the um, uh, later uh, acquisition of knowledge uh, which substantially affects the honesty or the recklessness of that uh, initial belief, uh, where he continues to publish unamended in spite of that uh, later acquired knowledge, uh, means that qualified privilege uh, no longer uh, obtains. Uh, and the malice which vitiates qualified privilege in, in libel is the same malice which is an ingredient of the tort of uh, malicious falsehood. There is then the Reynolds privilege, which is, is where my friend and I both acknowledge this gets rather complicated. Reynolds privilege is an Article 10 gloss on uh, qualified privilege. Uh, means that as a general rule, because Reynolds privilege is looking both at the um, objective uh, steps taken by journalists to verify their information, but to a certain extent also their, their subjective and, and the genuineness of their belief that what they were doing was in the public interest. Essentially, Reynolds' species of QP will not arise where malice subsists. 
Um, so it's rare to talk about uh, Reynolds being subsequently defeated by malice. If there is malice, R Reynolds won't arise. But as we'll see, you could have a Reynolds QP case where there is publication which is clearly covered by Reynolds QP. But then information comes forward that means that the publication is no longer sustainable on that basis. Uh, and the QP falls away because of information that becomes known uh, to the publisher. Uh, and this species of sort of um, intervening information that, that destroys a form of qualified privilege, whether it's Reynolds or common law or statutory, is known as Luchansky malice after the Luchansky case, which I'm not going to turn up to have three. Um, I have included uh, it in the bundles, uh, and I don't think I have anything like the time uh, to do them in any detail. Um, two cases which are by Luchansky. There are very few cases on Luchansky malice. Um, one of them is Flood, which was uh, a Reynolds QP case, uh, and uh, Mr. Justice Tugan ha held, uh, it was about an investigation into the extradition unit of the Metropolitan Police uh, as, as to whether there was a leak, and um, there was an investigation, and Mr. Justice Tugan ha uh, held that uh, publication uh, of the Times in the print edition uh, was covered, and indeed its online publication of its uh, old uh, newspapers was covered online up to September 2007, but not thereafter, because it continued unamended after the investigation had reported, and the Times knew the investigation had reported, <coughs> that there was no longer any substance to that case. So Q Reynolds QP subsisted up to a certain point in time, but then no longer. Uh, Kadir it is a, a very complicated case, um, uh, and I'm not gonna uh, do it in uh, any detail, um, but it's uh, an example of uh, effectively Luchansky malice uh, in the context of both common law and, and statutory qualified privilege uh, in, in relation to reports uh, from courts uh, and about the reporting of both sides. Just for your ladyships and your lordships note, um, the, the nub of both cases um, in the head notes flood, uh, we would ask um, your ladyships and your lordship to look at H11, uh, which is the nub of the flood case, uh, and for Gidea it's uh, H29 to 32. Um, the pleaded case uh, on Luchansky malice is incredibly thin, uh, and my learned friend makes uh, an entirely fair criticism, uh, which is to say that uh, there are three things that we really rely on uh, for our Luchansky malice, uh, and only one of them is pleaded. There is a reason for that. Uh, one of them that is pleaded is a, a letter of unequivocal denials that was sent uh, that, that led to uh, publication uh, in, in any event. Uh, but the other two are that one of the very serious allegations made against my client is that somehow he was involved in the um, uh, Russian attempts to subvert the 2016 US presidential election. Uh, there is absolutely no truth to that. But the basis upon which the defendants asserted that they had a right to publish that was on the basis of the announcement that the Senate Intelligence Committee wanted information um, from my client. And it's, it's that with great glee that there are stories that go up trying to create all sorts of dot joining, verging on conspiracy theory leaks between my, my client and, and various other people, uh, including General uh, Michael Flynn. The Senate report uh, comes uh, after we've issued the claim, I think possibly even after we've uh, drafted the particulars of claim, but it's included in the defendant's evidence. And you will see from Mr. Doris's uh, uh, evidence where he cites the, I think it's three sentences out of a 700 page Senate report that mention my client and not within a million miles of suggesting that he has anything to do with the 2016 US presidential election in the United States at all. This is the defendant's evidence that they put in of that recently published Senate report. And there's nothing about my client being in any way involved. So whilst I recognise that were a Luchansky malice case to proceed on the basis of the Senate report as well as the letter already pleaded at paragraph 40 particulars of claim, it would have to include that. We say that similarly to the flood case, where you have made an incredibly serious allegation that there are you know, strong grounds to suspect involvement in a particular thing, and then a definitive report from the investigation that you said justified your publication of that allegation in the first place comes out and makes absolutely no findings that are within a million miles of that allegation. There is surely, we say, a duty to correct that, if not even take down the entire article, and the failure to do so, we say, gives rise to an arguable case uh, uh, of Luchansky malice. Uh, 
for your lordships and your uh, sorry uh, for your ladyships and your lordships note uh, the relevant correspondence uh, between the second defendant and my client's solicitor is at pages B one four one and the response uh, B one forty. And then see how those responses are reflected in uh, publication eight, which is uh, A241. Great. I think that might be a typo in the particular I will have to clarify that. And forgive me, there might be a, a, a year typo in the particulars as to the date of. If I've got that wrong, I will um, uh, confer with Mr. Price and Sentinel, and I'll surely ask you. Uh, and the reason that this is so serious is that these sorts of uh, allegations, you, you'll see from B156 to 157, where, when we're in correspondence with the Telegraph newspaper who are re reporting these, they're specifically referring to the forensic news reporting on this as the basis for their subsequent reporting in this jurisdiction. Uh, that's at B156 to 157. Uh, and then finally, of course, uh, and obviously this wouldn't be pleaded, but in the particulars of claim which are served on the defendants as part of the order and application ordered by Mr Justice Nixon, it's served in October. Since October, again, there is no correction. There is no takedown of the articles, even though there is a, a pleading with a statement of truth saying these are the facts that are just inaccurate. They are just wrong. There is no basis for them. And so we say there is... Uh, a case that could survive summary judgment on Luchansky matters because there has been no editing or, or, or changing of very serious allegations in spite of clear and categorical denials in correspondence in a pleading with the statement of truth uh, and also the product of the Senate Intelligence uh, Committee uh, report. Uh, Mr Justice Jay uh, rejected this case uh, in, in a single paragraph. Oh, I should just say, malice, of course, is not governed by the single meaning rule. It's the subjective belief of the defendants as to the meaning of what they had published, the so-called Bollock and Morris meaning that counts for purposes of malice. And that's why it's relevant that we had served them uh, in October with our particulars of claim that set out not only our alleged single meanings, but also the subsidiary meanings in malicious falsehood. So a defendant might well be able to escape a finding of malice by saying, oh, I have no idea that anybody would read it in this particular way. But in respect of continuing publication after having received our particulars of claim, that would no longer be available to the second defendant. He is on notice that this is what we say it means. It, and obviously there's no single meaning rule in malicious falsehood, but we set out our meanings. So the question of his Bonnock and Morris you know, belief as to what the meaning of the article is after that point, we say that's why the particulars are particularly significant. Um, this is dealt with uh, then by uh, Mr Justice Jay, uh, just at uh, paragraph uh, 97. Of the judgment, uh, which is on page uh, A114. Uh, He did accept there was marginally greater force in my submission that the Senate Intelligence Committee's report had little to say about the claimant, but I was not asked to consider the scope of the evidence it received, and its terms of reference were much narrower than the scope of publications one to eight. There is a fair point in there. The Senate Intelligence Committee's report would only be uh, relevant on Luchansky Mellis in respect of the single meanings in libel or the subsidiary meanings in malicious falsehood, uh, which related to uh, election interference. That was the subject of the report. So I do accept that if I had a, a, an article case, it, it would only relate to um, the, those elements of the claim. The, the final point uh, in, in the remaining few minutes uh, is uh, the issue around um, Section 3 of the Defamation Act 1952. Uh, and this can be found in the Cross Appeal Authorities uh, at tab A. Um, sorry. Uh, 
uh, tab eight, we've included um, both section two and section three of the 52 Act. Uh, 52 Act arose from a private member's bill following, I think, the Fox, Fox Committee. Um, but a private member's bill uh, it introduced the Act. They had been asked, or, or I think one of the recommendations was, uh, so yes, it's tab A, was to abolish the distinction between libel and slander altogether. Uh, and Parliament decided not to do that. But what it did in section two is it codified one of what before the 2013 Act were the four outstanding species of slander per se. Uh, and that's slander affecting uh, official professional business reputation. Not a huge amount of case law from the High Court in section two, but you can see that it relieves, section two relieves a slander claimant of having to uh, allege or prove special damage. Um, if the words are calculated to disparage in relation to his office, uh, profession, calling, trade, or business. Section three, we always think of as the malicious falsehood section, but its title, of course, is actually slander of title, and it applies to also slander of goods or other malicious falsehood. And it works in a similar way as the codification of um, slander per se. Um, in an action for malicious falsehood, it shall not be necessary, and these are the key words, should not be necessary to allege or prove special damage if the words upon which the action is founded are calculated to cause pecuniary damage and are in writing or other permanent form, or if the said words are calculated to cause pecuniary damage in respect of any office, profession, calling, trade or business held or carried on at the time of publication. So the purpose of section three, like the purpose of section two, is to absolve uh, a claimant of the need to not only prove, but even allege uh, special damage. Um, essentially, we uh, there is a mistake in my skeleton argument. Um, you'll see at paragraph 61, uh, I say that there are three paragraphs that we think that were relative to this. Paragraph 16, and I'm so sorry, it's not actually the particulars of the claim. Paragraph 16 was paragraph 16 of the original summary of the particulars of the claim, which is not in the appeal bundle. It was before Mr Justice J, but it wasn't in the particulars, if that's where you're looking for it. The only two paragraphs in the original particulars of claim proper were paragraphs 42 and 57.3. Uh, and you'll see from my skeleton argument, 61b, uh, in paragraph 42, they're centred on his professional life, they're calculated to have a pecuniary effect on his business and that of his companies. The claim will rely on section 3.1 of the 52 Act. Uh, the publication of words complained of contained uh, within the publication set up both was calculated to cause pecuniary damage to the claimant in respect of his role as a businessman. Uh, and it sets out the reasons why it targeted his businesses, named, identified them, received the allegations would make it highly unlikely that the recipient would enter into business with him or use his services. And then at 57.3, as a result of the defendant's actions, he's been forced to present explanations to family members, business partners and companies who demanded them. The compliance departments of banks have required the claimant to rebut the false and defamatory allegations made and required the claimant to incur considerable expense. So notwithstanding that we were absolved of pleading and proving special damage because of section three, this pleading was deemed insufficient. Uh, even on the reverse summary judgment test, because of uh, the citation by uh, Mr. Justice J at 98, of Mr. Justice Tugan having Tesla Motors, uh, and we set that out at uh, uh, paragraph 62 of the skeleton. Um, uh, and Mr. Justice Tugendhat had said, the claimant, uh, notwithstanding um, that, that he relies on section three, the claimant must nevertheless give particulars of the nature of the allegedly probable damage. Uh, probable comes to the fact that calculated has been construed to mean more likely than not. The claimant must nevertheless give particulars of the nature of the allegedly probable damage and the grounds relied on for saying that it is more likely than not. Uh, and then he gives the example of a trader having to incur expenses in advertising and other forms of publicity to counter the effects, which is what we said we'd had to do with the compliance forms of banks. On the other hand, the damage, which is more likely than not to be a consequence, may be a delay in sales or a given number of vehicles or a loss of sales of a given number of vehicles or the difference between prices uh, but for the publication of the falsehood complaint of. In such cases, then the particulars of claim should likewise identify that probable damage. And we'd said people would be much less likely to deal with the claimant if they read that he is involved in money laundering and he's a front for the Kremlin. So we, we think that even if Mr Justice Tugendhat is, is right about the pleading burden under Section 3, we satisfied it. We certainly think we satisfied it on a reverse summary judgment basis. 
But then there is the question as to whether or not Mr Justice Tooley has right to impose what sounds like a pleading burden to identify uh, losses that are more probable than not. That sounds an awful lot like pleading special damage, which is exactly what Section 3 of the Act is designed to absolve a claimant of having to do. Well, no, uh, we all know that there are many cases in which it's impossible to tie particular losses to, to particular publications. In fact, it's almost never possible. Um, but there, it, there are many cases in which you can recover general damages for likely financial loss. Yes. Um, this is somewhere in that zone. It's not in that, quite in that category. Um, but I think you'd agree that um, the claimant cannot recover damages for injury, financial, or, or, or of any other kind to his company. They're se separate entities. But to that extent, this is an untenable pleading. The, the plea says both that he will suffer pecuniary loss and that his company will. Yes, will. but the companies, uh, we can ignore the companies. They're not claimants, mm -hmm. and he can't claim for loss that they've suffered. Uh, in most circumstances, my, my late friend and I have just been arguing about the Supreme Court's decision in Marex and the, the rule against reflective loss well, in another case. But yes, it's, I, I would, as a general proposition, accept that. So, um, on Mr Justice Tugendhat's analysis, the pleading needs to tell us enough um, to mount a tenable case that some financial loss is likely, in the sense of probable, um, to Agreed. this claimant. Um, and does it say enough about what it, is, what it is about his business activity, other than those of his company, um, that would um, lead to financial loss if he were shunned? Forgive me, it's another way of putting a lawyer's question. Is the plea demorable because we've not identified any loss that would be specifically outside the rule against reflective loss? That's probably a neater way of putting it. Um, uh, and that might be the case. That might be the case, my lord. I, I would say I think it's a case that we can meet by amendment. And on reverse summary judgment, it wouldn't be appropriate to for, for it to go away entirely there. Um, the, we have said um, that the compliance departments of banks. I have said I would have to take instructions on the on the particularity of this because there's an. That that looks like special damage to me. He's, that's an allegation that, that um, it, as far as the compliance uh, 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 departments of banks, they've done something um, uh, uh, which has required considerable it, expenses. That's actual. Well, I mean, I was going to say that, that almost. Uh, I, I, there's a question about bootstrapping on where, where a person is saying, for instance, I had to hire a PR company because you defamed me. Um, I mean, it's possible that, that will be special damages. I think there's a very serious question as to whether or not, for instance, you could bootstrap a serious financial loss uh, element in libel. But it might well be that, insofar as he's having to do with banks personally, not just as the director of his companies, if he has, and I don't have instructions on this, but if he has suffered that uh, expense personally, your lordship's right. Not only would that certainly satisfy the test set down by Mr Justice Tugendhat in Section 3, it might well also give rise to a claim for special damage if, if the sum was significant enough um, to, to, to be claimable. So we say we, we do have an, an arguable case, at least one uh, capable of resisting a summary judgment, whether or not Mr Justice Tugan ha, ha, has set the bite bar too high in Tesla or, or not. I have strayed uh, over my hour and a quarter. Sorry, it's because, because of my interruption. No, it, it's not my fault, but I'm very kind. Um, unless I can just go over. Thank you very much. Yes, yes <coughs> My ladies, my lord, um, good morning. The, um, the task I have is to essentially uphold the reasoning and conclusion of the judge on the two uh, issues. Um, the, in relation to the GDPR, um, there's really only one um, matter of law that I need to deal with in any detail. Um, and the, 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 in relation to the malicious uh, falsehood claim, I'm going to focus my fire on the malice issue more than I will on the section 3 issue. But before I um, turn to those uh, at all, um, I, I would like to just make some um, observations about the reverse summary judgment test, because of course we're in um, territory where th these weren't substantive um, decisions. Um, but decisions according to that. But what's striking uh, about the task tasks presented to the judge below mm -hmm. is that there were, was no dispute about the evidence in the crucial respect uh, that, that, that um, fueled his decisions on these issues. 
and it wasn't asserted either by the claimant that further evidence might emerge that could give succor to his arguments at trial or even um, at, at a more preliminary stage if the proceedings were allowed to continue so in fact what the judge had on these points and particularly have in mind the GDPR point was pretty full evidence from the defendants as to their activities the re their relationship or lack of relationship with the union um, the currencies in which they uh, the, the, the platform that they used to sell their merchandise operated and so on the quantum of a single baseball cap and so on detailed full evidence that you'll have seen a little bit of yesterday um, and no suggestion that that was um, capable of being undermined that there was anything wrong with it that it wasn't sufficient or that more of it would uh, be available further down the line so whilst it is a reverse summary judgment text um, it's worth remembering um, the principles uh, as recently set out in the easy air case which I've got uh, at tab three of the first file of the authorities bundle uh, on, on this cross appeal internal page 144 page 15 of the judgment so this is the formulation that um, first instance uh, judges in particular have been relying on modifying a little bit and adapting since um, certainly the, the last decade or so um, so I thought it might be helpful to look at it sorry which bundle are you in? I beg your pardon my lady I'm in the authorities bundle on the cross appeal yes the first file behind tab three oh easy in here bit easier and open in telecom. And one finds these enumerated principles cropping up, or whatever they are, this, this, um, these factors. These, uh, uh, and I just want to highlight a couple because it, 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 it's pretty well worn. Um, so it's at five. Um, reaching its conclusion the court must take into account not only the evidence actually placed before it on the application for summary judgment but also the evidence that can reasonably be expected to be available at trial not that um, then at six although a case may turn out at trial not to be really complicated it, not decided, it, should, it should be decided without further investigation of the facts thus the court should hesitate about making a final decision without a trial, even where there is no obvious conflict of fact at the time of the application. We should hesitate where reasonable ground exists for believing that a fuller investigation into the facts of the case would add to or alter the evidence available to the trial judge, and so affect the outcome of the case. Um, and then at seven, um, the, the point is made about if there's sufficient evidence before the court on, an, on a summary application applying the reverse summary judgment test, um, points of law, even novel points of law, um, can be decided. Uh, so I say these are pertinent to what this judge did in this case, both in relation to the evidence uh, and, and his decision as to whether it was uh, sufficient for the uh, Three factors, um, and also um, whether he was sufficiently equipped to deal with the point of law that arose on article three. And we say that he was, as I've submitted, there's no suggestion by the claimant that uh, further facts might emerge, either on disclosure or in, in any other way, that would assist the specific case. So we are in territory where the judge was entitled to come to his conclusion. So, uh, really, then we have to see what it is the claimant says he got wrong, given that it's actually not in the opinion. And the criticisms 
are almost exclusively about his um, evaluation. I'll deal first with the criticisms in relation to Article 3.1. Before I do, I should make one more point, which is, is that um, you will have noticed that the um, passages from the ECJ judgment that were placed before the judge and the statutory the European materials are the EDPB guidelines and the, um, the, 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 uh, the GDPR provisions themselves um, are exactly the same as those that have been put before this court. Um, the claimant goes no further here in relying on materials than he did below. Again, the quibble is that the, the, the judge got it wrong. This court is invited to make different decisions. Uh, on the same material, in factual and legal material. We, the, 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 the submissions on this appeal are effectively a rerun. We went through the three cases below in some detail with the judge, the three ECJ cases. We, look, we looked together at the EDPB guidelines for assistance on Article 3 because there's no other law on it. We're doing the same again today. So in relation to Article 3.1, the complaint is that the um, judge committed some errors of law or logic, as it's put, Pamelona Frenzy. And he has atomized those complaints. And they are as follows. The judge did not accept that in the context of the United States website, less than a handful of subscriptions, cancelable subscriptions, emanating from the UK, amounted to an arrangement which was stable. The claimant disagrees and says that that is uh, sufficient. Judge has made his finding. No error of law has been identified in, in relation to, 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 to that. The, the next complaint is that the judge did not regard so few cancellable subscriptions as capable of amounting to a stable arrangement. Because they are cancellable. But the claim says subscriptions are the most stable of arrangements. The judge considered this point and, and, and rejected it. And then there's the tweet. But the judge did not say in terms that it was not relevant. But he obviously thought it added little. His words in the judgment are, to the extent that it improves the claim of the case slightly, um, it, 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 it post-dated. So he, he had that in mind. He carefully considered the claimant's point and, and rejected it. Can you just remind me where we are in the judgment being of these points? So I will um, just uh, so it's from um, Is it 60? It's 59. We, we, we start at 45 and then these issues are uh, disposed of from around 64, which is on um, page 107, internal to the first file, which is um, behind tab. The judgment behind tab is quickly uh, installed. Um, so the uh, All of the points now made before you are points considered by the judge on the correct uh, statutory and uh, material taking into account the case law that the judge was invited to consider. So I, I 
said that the, the issue begins with paragraph 45, page 102. If you look through what we, at the judge's approach, it's extremely comprehensive. Um, start with article 79, as invited to by the claimant. And then um, goes through article 3, looks at the recitals, which we've invited to point out to you, the relevant recitals. And then um, remarks upon what he can draw from the three PCJ cases on article 3 1. And then draws his conclusion. goes through the, 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 fact, the factual um, the fact Sh relevant. Shall, shall we look at 67? So, yes, my lady, I was just going to come on to 3.2. Come so I've dealt with 3.1 and the, and the complaint of that. It, it, it gets a little trickier in 3.2 um, for, for a couple of reasons. One is that there's no case law. So the material that the judge was considering mm. uh, was the article itself and the recitals and the EDPB guidelines. There's nothing else to go on. Um, and secondly, because it is right, so he doesn't expressly deal with um, the, the pleaded case that the website itself was a service offered to um, the EU. But as I'll deal with in a moment, that, that is implicit. And it's implicit in accordance with the way it's dealt with by the, by the EDPB guidelines. So, so just now to um, deal with uh, paragraph 67. There's a distinction between Article 3.1 and 3.2 which is that in Article 3.1, um, processing may be in the context of the activities of the controller or processor established in the EU, whereas the operative word in Article 3.2 is related to, rather than in the context of. Um, and here, it's worth going back to the guidelines themselves because they are um, obviously not binding, but they are careful and they do in fact seek to draw in some other case law. Which is relevant. So Article 3.2 applies if, if the claimants fail to persuade anyone that the um, defendants are relevantly established in the EU. We're in 3-2 territory where in any event they might um, owe some uh, data protection obligations because uh, they offer goods or services um, or monitor. So can I ask the court to turn to the guidelines now, which are behind tab C in the first volume of the Cross Appeal Authority Handbook. Um, So it, we start to um, deal with Article 3.2 at page 13, internal, internal to that document. Application of the targeting criteria. The absence uh, of an establishment in the union does not necessarily mean that processing activities by a data controller or processor established in the third country will be excluded from the scope of the 
in 3-2 sets out the circumstances in which the junior guard's eyes to a control operator are not established in the unit, depending on their processing activities. What is crucial is to identify the processing activities in Q, because it is those, it is the character of those processing activities that will determine whether 3-2 is engaged. Um, and then we can skip over to uh, the next page. It's the, the, the italicized second paragraph on that page. Starting Article 3.2 of the GDPR provides, as you see, sets out the purpose of 3.2. And here we see that if we offer uh, goods or services, whether or not payments are required, the data subjects can be renewed or monitor their behaviour and processing related to those activities may be caught by Article 3.2. The next paragraph it, it unpacks that but to a degree. The application of the targeting criterion for which data subjects are in the union as per Article 3.2 can be triggered by processing activities carrying the control operators are not established in the union, which relates to two distinct and alternative types of activities. Provided that these processing activities relate to data subjects that are in the union. And then the next paragraph, which we relied on below and is picked up on by the judge, the EDPB stresses that a controller or processor may be subject to the GDPR in relation to some of its processing activities, but not subject to the GDPR in relation to other processing activities. So the mere fact that processing activities of different kinds are carried out by the same controller or processor doesn't make them related to each other for these purposes. Or well, that um, paragraph couldn't make sense. It's why we say it's, it's vital to look at the activities themselves. Um, we can skip forward to page 16 now. The, uh, the guidance I, I'd ask you to look at is, is sandwiched between the two boxes at the top of the page. Moreover, it should be noted that the processing of personal data of EU citizens of res or residents that takes place in a third country does not trigger the application of the GDPR as long as the processing is not related to a specific offer directed at individuals in the EU or to a monitoring of their behaviour in the union. So from that we take that in order to bring uh, oneself within the scope of Article 3.2, we must be complaining of processing related to the offer that, we're, uh, that, that, that has been made by the processor, or, or to monitoring of our behaviour. And then um, further down the page, the, the board goes on to, to look at um, what offering goods or services might mean. And this is where we say that although the judge didn't deal with the facts directly in relation to the issue directly in relation to Article 3.2, the um, setting up of a website that is available in a third country uh, was dealt with in, in, in the analysis in relation to Article 3.1. Uh, where it, the, it is the case that it is not sufficient that simply by operating a website that is available in a third country, one is taken to be uh, offering services to that uh, country. Um, and then over the page, for more elucidation, 
elucidation on this point. It's worth reading uh, from the, 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 the board then looks at the recitals um, for a bit of help. And you'll see then in the middle of the page reference to another ECJ uh, case from, from a slightly different context that is said to give some assistance. We don't need to look at that. Sorry, um, which page are you on now? Page 17, my lady. And, um, but reading from adjacent to the bottom hole punch, while the notion of directing an activity differs from the offering of goods or services, this is a, a, a closely related concept. Um, the EDPB offers some criteria which it considers would be of assistance. I did wonder about, yes, it's in some cases that's about contracts, isn't it? Yes. Um, and those criteria are then bullet pointed below. So it's not, it, I'm as attractive as it may be to look at the drafting of Article 3.2 um, and give it a really open reading. The, the, the board stresses that that must have uh, some degree of rational control within it, that, um, that reading. And it can be provided for by these factors. Because otherwise, I hate to use a floodgates argument, but otherwise it would literally be any website anywhere in the world shores um, may fall foul of section 13. The limiting factors are, are suggested here. And then um, at paragraph 67 of the judgment you'll see a reference to um, the EPB's guidance generally, guidelines generally, and then um, but to paragraph 66, as explained in the EDPB guidelines, no more than a cursory examination, they're listed in this year, so as to demonstrate how far short the claimant can reasonably Judge has considered these in this year. He was taken to them by the defendant. Um, as I say, if there is an absence in his reasoning on Article 3 to an explicit reference to the fact that the website itself offers news services, uh, that we say is dealt with in his analysis of Article 3.1. He says it's clear that, at paragraph 64, it is clear that the first defendant's journalistic endeavour is not oriented towards the UK in any relevant respect. Uh, and, and then he goes on. He has considered those <coughs> factors in the context of, of the submission that the the website, news website itself being available here might be taken to be offering a service in the year. So that leaves, um, with an eye on the clock, that leaves the issue of monitoring. And here I'd ask you to look back at the guidelines again, so that you still have them open, and I'm sorry for jumping around. So the guidelines are at tab C of the first volume of authorities on the cost I'm at page 19. I mean, it's surprising that there isn't there's so, so, so little authority on this fairly fundamental question. Yes, my lady. And, um, uh, well, hopefully that will change. <laughs> so 
it is surprising. It, all, I mean, the, 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 the cases that we looked at on 3.1 are rich and fairly well trodden, um, but 3.2 is ignored. Being potentially, if given extremely expensive reasons, um, very, very far reaching. Mm. So, um, mo monitoring of data subject behavior is the, is the heading at section C on page 19. The second type of activity triggering the application of 3.2 is monitoring of data subject behavior as far as their behavior takes place within the union. Now, the, the submission from the claimant was that taking a journalistic activity of somebody is monitoring their behaviour, and of course, in a broad vernacular sense, I suppose that's that's right. But it's not what Article Three Two is directed at when it talks about monitoring. Um, the, the phenomenon of behavioural monitoring, monitoring, using large data sets and machine learning, um, may be familiar to the bench. Is one of the greatest challenges of the internet, how to regulate that, um, and um, the, the degree to which it impinges on personal autonomy, freedom of thought, freedom of expression, and so on. Um, and it is that that we're, it is in that territory that, that, that we sit when we talk about monitoring for these purposes. Um, persuasive technology that uses monitoring to collect data and then um, advertise to individuals uh, it, it is, is a huge issue. And um, data protection is the is perhaps slightly surprising answer to the regulation of that technology. Um, and here we have um, a provision which enables those who are monitored for those purposes to seek some remedy if the monitoring takes place um, in, in Related to activity in, in the EU. Um, so the bottom paragraph on page 19 really deals with this, begins to deal with this, and explain what, what the provision is aimed at. And it, go, it, it helpfully um, goes back to recital principle. The nature of the processing activity, which has been considered behavioral monitoring, is further specified in recital principle which states that in order to determine whether a processing activity can be considered to monitor the behaviour of data subjects, it should be ascertained whether natural persons are tracked on the internet, including potential subsequent use of personal data processing techniques, which consist of profiling natural persons, particularly in order to take decisions concerning her or him, or for analysing or predicting her or his personal preferences and we say that to jam journalistic activity into the recital principle, the definition of monitoring is artificial. It conflicts with Article 10 of the Convention, if we need to make that definition. Um, but in any event, uh, it, 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 it is um, clearly contrary to the purpose which recital principle. It's a different type about. of monitoring, but why isn't why isn't it still monitoring and? Um, Mr. Cowes points to the technologically neutral um, point of, of um, the regulations, which are designed to um, protect the privacy of, amongst other things, of individuals and their and what is done with their data. Yes, well, that, that is a point with which I won't. And that's how they express it. Let me deal with the first part of the question. Um, it is monitoring, but it is not monitoring of the kind described in Recital 24. So, journalistic activity would not seek, for example, to predict uh, personal preferences. Behavioural monitoring does. Um, or, 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 or it might, journalistic activity might uh, purport to analyse personal preferences. <laughs> write a comment piece about them, but again, this is a little bit strange. Um, so, we, um, so the first thing, it should be ascertained whether natural persons are tracked on the internet. Well, it may be said that Googling somebody is tracking them on the internet. Um, I'm sure. 
Or you can set up a Google alert so that every time that their name is mentioned on the internet, you get an alert. Yes, and a journalist may well do that. So we it's just we, we, we may get journalists using that sort of tracking in the broader sense, including uh, potential subsequent use of personal data, de of data processing techniques. Well, the, 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 the data processing techniques um, in issue here are intended to be automated processing on large data sets in order to ascertain behavioral preferences and seek them to um, persuade. I, there are journalists who... Well, it include, I mean, it, I mean, it can include a result, sorry to interrupt, but mm -hmm. it can include a result when, you know, you the cases, sort of cases we dealt with in Google and Beadle Hall, where you have um, put in an internet search for refrigerators and, and bingo, 15 advertisements for refrigerators suddenly appear on your... On your, on your for, for months. For months. <laughs> yes. So it, it, there's it, it, a combination of sort of the big data set and the individual targeting. My lady's right, and and there's a crucial um, element here, which is that because of the way the website in this case was set up, in common with virtually all other websites, um, it 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 uses third party. Um, Technology that does engage in that kind of behavioral processing. Um, and it may be that if you visited this website, you, you maybe advertised the fridge for that reason. Um, that isn't related, we say, to the journalistic activity, not related in the sense, um, the narrow sense that we say related to Musk, um, uh, Musk convey his purpose. That we're talking about two different things. What the journalists do in using Google, um, irrespective of which adverts they're served when they do that, um, is journalistic research, uh, which it would be artificial to say is um, use of the internet or the potential subsequent use of personal data processing techniques for analysing or predicting personal preferences, behaviours and attitudes. Maybe an error in the drafting of um, this element of three two, but it is so broad. But it, 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 uh, such a broad reading uh, would effectively destroy its purpose because what, what it's intended to get at is behavioural monitoring, not journalistic activity. And you'd presumably have to construe it um, compatibly with Article Ten of the ECHR and whatever the equivalent is in the uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights. Yes. But there's nothing in, in instinctively wrong with the notion that privacy, the privacy law that applies to people within the EU should protect them against foreign journalists conducting organized crawls of the internet to collect a mass of data about them. Is that? Um, not fundamentally. The... Um, <laughs> The, I mean, there are other avenues by which such activity can be challenged. Um, it wouldn't be a natural fit, we say, to seek to suggest that they are monitoring for um, behavioural analysis purposes. But um, there is nothing wrong with the proposition that EU data subjects should on any, on one or other ground. Um, I mean, that, that if it was a misuse of private information claim, for example, um, we, we wouldn't be looking at these articulations, but we could be thinking about other other factors, um, and one would have to see how it was put. But here, here in any event, um, we say there has to be. A between the activity, the journalistic activity, and then on 
one hand, and then the automated uh, cookie type data collection and processing on the other. But in any event, it is, is conducted by third parties, and, and, and of which the individual clients have no control or knowledge. I mean, they have control whether to turn them on or off, but that's a commercial issue. Um, Do you want to go on to read what's on page, the following page? Yes, if you've read perhaps the, the end of the, the paragraph, page 19 first, the bottom mm -hmm. paragraph, while recital 24 exclusively relates to the monitoring of behaviour through the tracking of a person on the internet, the board considers that tracking through other types of network or technology involved in personal data should be taken into account. And, and the examples there are smart devices and, and wearables. middle of the paragraph on the next page, the e e board does not consider that any online collection or analysis of personal data of individuals would automatically count for monitoring if an SSP did this for all its purpose. Processing the data, in particular, any subsequent behavioural analysis or profiling techniques involving the data. So that really is a repetition of the preceding paragraph. Um, and, and then the, the, the board takes into account Recital 24, and then the examples are given, which I hope are reasonably aligned with the examples I gave, table addresses, geolocation, online tracking through use of cookies, CCTV, market surveys, behavioural studies, um, monitoring of, of health status. What about CCTV? Um, Quite sure what, is it, what that's intended to mean. Actually, it's, it's given CCTV there, but I suppose monitoring people by the use of CCTV. But I mean, that, that obviously has data techniques used for that. Um, that arise in any event without the, without the need to be in this in the monitoring element. <coughs> So, um, I've got an eye on the clock, so I'll, I'll move on unless I can just um, have it in relation to Article 3 2. The judge dealt with the day. Um, the The complaints about it are. So I'll turn then. I, I, I mean, the, these are big. Just returning to Article Three for a moment, the big issues, as your agency points out, um, and we have to deal with them sh shortly because we're on timetable. Um, but the judge gave them extremely uh, serious consideration. The, the, in fact, the, the, the GDPR issue took up. I think it's fair to say the majority. Of time in the hearing below, which is over two years, um, and gave them very careful consideration. And um, your, your task, of course, is, is, is to identify an error um, that is reasoning or logic, given that, that the evidence is uncontested, and we say there, there isn't one, and that simply put, um, given there was no prospect of any further evidence emerging, um, he was able to make a decision as to whether or not uh, what these defendants were doing uh, gave rise to territorial application of Article 3. So, moving then, I made the initial challenge. I can take this very quickly. The T 
two cases relied upon, Flood and Kadir, are, we say, not of assistance. Firstly, let, let, let me say this. We, we acknowledge that there may be circumstances in which um, malice may arise because the knowledge of a defendant changes. And if, and if that's to be characterized as we can't see malice, so be it. That seems to me to be uncontroversial. And in fact, the judge, um, Mr. Justice Jay, didn't disagree with that either. He was simply asked to assess on the pleadings um, and the case put before him whether there was a tenable case that that had arisen in, in this case. And he declined to do so. In um, Flood, we say that Flood probably in truth and in modern terms isn't a case about malice in any event. Um, and obviously it's a, it's a case about Reynolds' privilege and uh, g g given the origin of the issue which is the continuing publication concept um, from one moment to the next the state of knowledge of a defendant has changed which means the next time they make a publication um, they cannot take advantage of the privilege but to, to analyze it in terms of malice is, um, may have been helpful at the time think to, 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 but it, it, it wouldn't be of assistance now and particularly on, under section 4 if, if it were to be run that way um, there could simply be no um, no basis to assert malice. And the same, to a lesser degree, in Kadir. The privileges involved in Kadir were um, statutory and common law privileges which fell away again at a point in time when. Uh, a reasonable defendant would have reported something that they failed to do. So again, um, whilst there is a need to inquire as to the state of mind of the defendant in these cases, it is only to inquire uh, what knowledge shift there has been. There's no dispute in Kadir that the journalist had or ought well to have had uh, knowledge of the change of circumstances. You'll hear what is alleged um, is far less secure. The three circumstances on which my learned friend relies need to be looked at quickly, and I'll do that by taking them from his uh, skeleton argument on this point. So that's. Um, Paragraph 53, which is on page 90. There's cases that the defendants um, were not malicious when they first published uh, the article, but became malicious as the first defendant, the second defendant. So he became m malicious at one of these three points in. Um, and the, the first as put is said to be the 15th of May 2019 I can demonstrate quickly how that's a typo and should be the 15th of May 2020 relevant, relevant crucially of course because it did not predate publication of this one so, um, if, if one takes up the first documentary bundle page 140, behind tab 7. Here we have the email upon which the claimant relies in seeking to establish malice. And you'll see
is. Sorry, give, give, give me the reference again, really. 140 medal of uh, the first supplementary bundle or supplementary bundle. Thank you very much. Sorry. Called B140. Um, the date you'll see is the 15th of May 2020, and the time of that email is 1911. In the judgment, and I will read this, I think, rather than we turn up too many files at once. Uh, paragraph 87 for your note. The evidence in support of the Chansky matter falls within a narrow compass. On the 15th of May 2019, the second defendant sent SR a request for comment. It is said by the claimant that the request was responded to in its entirety with definitive answers by the claimant's lawyer, and the second defendant was made unambiguously aware of the falsity of the allegation. That, that's the paragraph 14 that you were saying. In my judgment, SR's response email, timed at 19.11 on the 15th of May 2019, is extremely brief. And does virtually nothing more than answer the defendant's question in the negative. So we've got two emails on the 15th of May, timed at 19.11. A year apart. I think it's being conceded. But it is. Yes. But the email that was relied upon in the particulars, and in fact by the judge, is dated 15th of May 2020. Crucially, then, there is no pre publication denial. I, I think that, therefore, that limb of the claimant's case on the chance to be mad must just fall away. We say it's weak in any event, it's a simple, bare denial by a claimant in relation to allegations shouldn't normally be enough to demonstrate malice. Um, but here there was none. Um, this denial was posted um, a year after the first publication. Uh, so this, this, this denial was sent a year, a year after. Um, does it have no bearing on continued publication? But it might do, my lady. And I, I think the, um, that, that's when the argument about its falsity kicks in, as it were. Um, we can do. Uh, the um, start on uh, page uh, 141, you'll see the, the email from the second dependent to the claimant's lawyer requesting comment. thank you very much in advance for your attention to this matter. And then the response is one, something actually that related to the same lawyer, not the claimant. And then a series of bare denials. And that's it. And what the claimant wants you to accept is that by sending that, he should have sufficiently dislodged um, in the minds of the defendants their belief in the uh, reasonableness of publishing the story to a degree that can be characterised as, ma as, as malice if they continue to publish it. It's not, not, not enough, as you say. In the Kadir case, of course, was, was there a, a fact that came to the attention, an objective fact filing of a complaint came to the attention of the journalist. Should have been a true story. There are no, there are no facts. Nothing objective has been put. No facts have been cleared up. So the second The second thing to have been pleaded is, is that continuing to publish various allegations um, about the claimant related to his the interest in him by the Senate Intelligence Committee um, once their report has been published engages in Chomsky matters and we say again too um, speculative the report itself uh, is redacted, um, and the in 
any event, in order to make this good, one would have to look at the way that the, that, that the Venice Intelligence Committee's interest in Clement was reported. And then the third leg is that they should have renew, reviewed their reporting on the piece of the pictures explained. It's worth pointing out that the pieces explained, like every other document in this case, are not signed by him. So in any event, um, he is uh, he is quite relevant. One thing that is relevant to is the claims criticism of the defendants for relying on a statement by their senior person in circumstances where malice was alleged against them. It was said that that's somehow improper. We don't accept that. And the, the, the complaint is made that, that the judge below rejected the claimant's case on the chance he malice in a single paragraph. I mean, that's just unfair because it was pleaded in half a paragraph at the end of a several page full frontal attack on my client's credibility, honesty, journalistic integrity. So um, the complaint that was dealt with shortly. So we say the judge was entitled to reject the insurance of the matter of theory. So even if um, the, the law upon which it was based uh, is capable of supporting that theory, um, in any event, in fact, it was too weak to rely on. So our submissions on section three are set out briefly at the end of our skeleton. I won't, um, I've run out of time, so I won't, I won't repeat them here. Um, so, unless I can assist you further, witness would like to hear those submissions. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Price. Yes. My ladies, my lord, um, just a few short points uh, in uh, reply. Uh, uh, really on the uh, GDPR. We, we don't agree with my little friend's characterization that um, uh, the loan judge had before him all the evidence, not only that was available, but that would be available at trial. Um, uh, and we'll make that good. They, I'm, we're not in any sense challenging the, the veracity of the evidence. I need to make that very, very clear. But if I could ask um, the, the court to turn uh, in the first volume of the supplementary bundle, uh, B. 253. Now, just so we can um, orient ourselves uh, in, in this, these are spreadsheets produced by the defendants and exhibited to their solicitor's witness statement. B253, it says spreadsheet of Patreon donations, but this is the first of the five categories of income. So this is actually the subscription that Mr. Doris talks about and describes as uh, subscriptions in his evidence. Then we have uh, uh, two pages of the one-off donations. That's the second category. Uh, and you'll see the subscriptions, we only have the three in euros, the three in pounds, and then sort of a general unspecified category of US dollars. It is on page 253. So it's a summary. So we don't actually know how many subscriptions there are in total, the absolute number of them. So we couldn't possibly say even what proportion are in pounds and euros. But you'll have already taken my point that the number in pounds and euros isn't necessarily the same as the number from the UK or the EU. Because for the first 14 of the 18 months that this evidence covers, everything was in US dollars wherever you come. So that information would be available on disclosure. It might turn out that even if Mr. Justice Jay was right, that six subscriptions, three in each of the European currencies was below the threshold of arguably minimal, there might be more. And that certainly wasn't before him. That, that would come out of trial. The, the next two uh, spreadsheets then are the one-off donations and the one after that is the, or oh, the two after that, I'm sorry, are the merchandising. But this is the underlying 
data that supported Mr. Doris's evidence. We don't quibble with the evidence as it stands, but we don't accept my learned friend's characterization that there's nothing more that could possibly come out on, for instance, how much of their income comes from the UK and EU as opposed to how much of it has most recently come in pounds and euros. It's true to say that the case of the Court of Appeal is, in a sense, a rerun of the case below. We don't consider it advice not to make completely short arguments in the Court of Appeal. It is a rerun of the case because we say that there were errors of principle in the judge's evaluation. And just to identify, if you like, the five errors of principle, they're really construction errors. There's the question of the meaning of stable. And apparently a subscription is not stable if it's cancellable. We say that's an error of construing what stable means. The judge didn't accept that the six subscriptions in the European currencies met even the summary judgment test for minimal. We say that sets too high a standard of what minimal would mean in the context of a relatively small business. There's the overt question of construction of related to, whether it should, in fact, be given a very narrow construction, narrower than in the context of. There's a question of construction of the word monitoring and whether, as my learned friend submits, it actually only applies to large data sets and machine learning and AI and exciting things like that. Or as we submit, monitoring means collecting data automatically or even manually in a filing system through whatever technological means if your purpose is to create a profile of a data subject in the union. But Mr. Justice Jay agreed that monitoring really meant something to do with cookies or large data sets. We say that's a fourth construction error. And the fifth, and this error is actually primarily one of the European Data Protection Board rather than Mr. Justice Jay, is the question of what the word offer means in Article 3.2. So stable, minimal, related to, monitoring, and offer. Five questions as to what those words mean. And an awful lot hinges on this because this is the question as to whether or not the data protection regime, which protects the data protection and privacy rights of European data subjects, is applicable at all if the company is not established and is based in the United States. It's an incredibly important question. To respond to my lady, Lady Justice Lange's question to my learned friend, does this need to be construed compatibly with Article 10? Obviously, any statutory instrument has to be construed compatibly with convention rights and here, charter rights. But it's a really quite important feature that we are looking in this part of GDPR at the territorial applicability of the regime at all. And in that sense, the purpose behind territorial applicability is you should give it a wide and expansive scope to catch all activities that might be subject to it. The sorts of exclusions and exemptions, particularly those that protect journalists, particularly those that are supportive of freedom of expression, are given effect as exemptions. So once GDPR is engaged and applies to the processing, Article 10 is protected by journalism exemptions, which apply as a matter of national law under Article 85. Or lawful basis for processing. Or lawful, you're right, my lord. It might be possible for a journalistic organization to say we don't need to rely on the exemption. We can show that this is lawful on legitimate interests or in other ways. But the protections for Article 10 don't need to be built into protecting from territorial scope. And so we do say that one of those, I think four of those, I've already made my submission, stable, minimal activity related to monitoring. Offer, I think, perhaps needs just a little more teasing out because the error creeps in. My learned friend took you to it in the EDPB guidelines. And it's internal page 17 of these guidelines, which is on page 33 of tab. Tab C, yes, page 33 in the electronic, 17 internal. Now, great respect has to be paid to the EDPB because in the absence of any authority, we've not been able to find any from any jurisdiction on Article 3.2. This is the board under GDPR of 
the IC, well, it was the ICO, but the, the European regulator. So certainly respect has to be given to it, um, uh, whatever way the court thinks right, but it's not certainly not binding on any court. What the EDPB is uh, reading into the word offer, so asking, does an entity offer goods and services into the European Union? Now, we say we'd, we'd get there anyway. We'd get there on the currency. we get there on um, the shipping addresses. So you see just over the page, there's a whole set of bullet points that they say might indicate whether someone offers things. And the final two are use of a language or currency other than that used in the trader's country especially if it's a language or currency of one or more EU member states. And then the data controller offers the delivery of goods in EU member states. I mean, we can meet the meaning of offer, even if the EDPB is right. But there's a reason to think that they might be wrong. And that's because um, they've looked at, uh, in Recital 23, uh, and they said, these sorts of factors look an awful lot like the sorts of factors that are relevant under Article 15 of the Brussels Recast Regulation, which is about jurisdiction over consumer contracts. So e even if normally a contract would be subject to uh, another law, a consumer has a right to bring proceedings in their own domicile. It's a rare exception in Brussels. Uh, sort of like central interest, but for consumer. But the problem is, what the Article 3 of GDPR is not a jurisdiction provision. The jurisdiction provision in Article uh, in GDPR is Article 79.2. That determines where people can bring cases. And it's a weighty thing to say that there's su sufficient proximity between a dispute and a particular territory for that court to have jurisdiction. That's quite a big thing. But, and the Brussels Recast Regulation, Article 15, is doing exactly that. It's saying the relationship is so proximate and so predictable that that court should have jurisdiction. But Article 3 is not doing the same thing. It's not allocating jurisdiction at all. That's done by Article 79.2. Article 3 is just saying that GDPR can apply to that processing. And so there's not a good policy reason to have quite the same emphasis on directed to EU citizens or targeted to them. We say it's actually much more passive. It could, it could be as little as offer to. Now, on our facts, it doesn't make an awful lot of difference. We say that we would get home on establishment because of the, the currencies and shipping address issue. But if we didn't, it's certainly more than enough to show uh, a case that would get home on targeting uh, consumers, even if we don't quite get over um, full establishment. Um, but we, we do say that it's, it's a question of construction that is actually quite important as the extent to which there needs to be that sort of targeting, specific targeting, in order for Article 3.2 to be engaged. Um, so beyond that, th those are the questions of construction, the sort of principles that we say that if Mr Justice Jay got it wrong would entitle this court to interfere in his evaluative decision on the facts. Uh, uh, again, uh, applying um, only the summary judgment test. Um, I I'm actually very grateful to my learned friend that there is, uh, if it weren't for an error of principle, there, there would have to be just a factual finding that was just um, uh, not capable of being sustained. And, and I answered my Lord Lord Justice Warby by saying I, I, I thought I had made the submission that the website was itself a service. We weren't just relying on the goods case of the merchandising. Uh, and I'm grateful to my learned friend. We have actually pleaded that the website is a service uh, at paragraph 18.1. That's back in the original? In the original particulars of claim, my Lord, yes, which will be at tab three of the supplementary. It, I mean, it's in both copies of the Petitions of Claim, it's just struck out in the one in the full bundle. Yes, it's very difficult to read that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, um, my little friend says that, that Mr. Justice Jay's rejection of that case is implicit in his rejection of our case on Article 3.1, but that doesn't follow. Even if Mr. Justice Jay was right to say that our case based on the tweets and the currencies wasn't sufficient to uh, ground establishment, it might still be much more than is sufficient for a case on targeting that would engage uh, the offer of goods and services under Article 3.2. So we say that is just a, that is an error of law. Um, the two final points that we would make. Um, it, it is, I think, conceded that because the uh, first defendant uh, website, uses Google Analytics and, uh, and does deal with Facebook and, and um, has the sorts of advertising cookies that obviously do monitor data subjects in the European Union who you say that they are targeting. 
there is processing going on uh, that um, would be within the scope uh, itself, if you were complaining about that processing, would be within the scope of GDPR. We accept the general proposition from the EDPB that Article 3.2 is geared at types of processing. So it is possible that you could have a controller who, even if it didn't break things out into subsidiaries, it was just a unitary controller in, let's say, the United States, that did two completely different types of processing activity, and they were completely unrelated. You couldn't, if one was aimed at the EU and the other wasn't, if they weren't related, then the one that wasn't related, GDPR wouldn't apply to it. We accept that as a general proposition. So if Google opened a, a car hire service specifically in the state of Arizona, and it only advertised its car hire service to people in Arizona, that, that would have nothing to do with its search engine business and advertising business, which does target you. So the personal data processed by the, the Arizona car hire company, we accept would be unrelated. We say that that can't possibly apply though here, where my own friend accepts that uh, the website uses third party technology, which includes third party advertising technology, but then it's fourth of five sources of income is income from that targeted advertising activity. And the economic raison d'etre, <laughs> the reason that they seek to raise that money from Google Ads on their own website is to fund the journalism which is the processing of the complaint. And so we accept the proposition that if, if two forms of processing are completely unrelated, GDPR could apply to one but not the other in a non-established controller. But what we're saying is they are manifestly related because the purpose of the raising money on the one hand is to fund the journalism of which we complain. Um, the, the very final point I would make is this. There is, as far as we're aware, uh, no case law uh, specifically on Article 3 and certainly not on the newer Article 3.2, uh, which doesn't even have uh, a predecessor under the directive and, and national law. Um, the decision of this court will be looked uh, or, or on this question uh, as to um, what forms of processing are brought by non-established controllers uh, is subject to GDPR. Uh, and we would say that there's a, a very fine line to be drawn, which is it, if uh, our cross appeal is dismissed, that a bright line can be drawn that these certain areas, this degree of proximity of relatedness or this you know, type of stability is simply out of scope that will draw a very uh, hard line as to what types of extraterritorial processing are within the scope of GDPR. Conversely, if, as we see, the cross appeal is allowed, it would allow development of this case on the facts at trial, but it would also allow a, a groundswell, and we say this is exactly what is needed on Article 3.2 to make this sufficiently certain for businesses, controllers, and data subjects alike, which is to have a range of decisions that are decided on full facts, not determined on an interlocutory basis so that the, the, the fine lines can be drawn organically by a, a, an accreted body of case law that is decided on the facts to work out what is uh, above minimal, what is sufficiently stable, what actually counts as monitoring, allow those decisions to go on the facts. And it's essentially the, the, the maximum summary judgment that in certain circumstances summary judgment should generally not be given in a developing area for law. This is a, an, a nascent, even inquiry area of the law. And so if this was a, a reverse summary judgment application, we would say it should be uh, refused on, on that basis alone. But it's another reason that we ask you applying that test in the context of a jurisdiction cross appeal. Uh, that's uh, yet another reason that we give uh, in uh, asking this court to allow our cross appeal. Unless I can assist the court any further.
decision from Julian Knowles on marriage now and reflective loss.
too.